There are quite a number of Christians today, especially the Gen X and the Millennials and the Gen Z, who gave up on Christianity because of this. That's right. There are quite a number of Christians today who gave up on their faith because they cannot believe anymore or they cannot defend the six-day creation. They don't know how to explain if Jonah was really eaten by the whale. They did not know how Noah can get all those animals into the ark. And when they were being questioned about their faith, about some of these events, they buckled. They did not know what to do, what to say. And as a result, it affected their faith. And they decided that their faith is not trustworthy anymore. And they gave up being a Christian altogether. Maybe that's your children. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your friend. I don't know. The question is, if you have given up, if that's you, if you have given up on Christianity unnecessarily, because you cannot defend this, I want to encourage you to think about your decision one more time. And I want you to know that you don't have to give up on your faith because you cannot defend this. But more on that later. The Bible is extremely important for us as a faith community. But I want to start by saying this right from the get-go, and I want you to not throw your rotten eggs or tomatoes at me, but this is true. This is what I really believe. The Bible, while being extremely, extremely important for our faith, it is actually not the foundation of our Christian faith, all right? Before you label me as heretic, I personally believe for myself that this is an inspired Word of God. I believe this collection of 66 books were written by people, ordinary men like you, like me. But the reason why their writing is so different is because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God Himself. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we're in the second week of our series, The Strong Foundation. Strong Foundation is important for us to address this question, especially in today's day and age, what must a person believe in order to be a follower of Jesus? What is essential and what is non-essential? What are you willing to die for and what are you willing to compromise on? All right? As mature followers of Jesus Christ, which all of us, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you want to aim to be, right? If you are mature followers of Jesus Christ, you must be able to distinguish between what is essential and what is peripheral, what is cultural, what is trendy for the time, all right? And it never ceases to amaze me how many Christians don't get this, and they argue over some of the silliest stuff, right? Uh, I get it. You know, a lot of the stuff that you hold dear, maybe that's what you've been brought up believing and all that. I'm not saying they're not important at all. But having said that, you got to know what is essential and what is merely good to know, good to have a conviction on. It will help you in your day-to-day -day life. But they are really, when you think about it, not essential to your faith. I want to give you a list of stuff that may cause you to leave this church if I put it up here. But I consider this stuff non-essentials, all right? We're talking about baptism, second coming of Christ, church structure or governance, women in ministry, issues over LGBTQ++ conversation, all right? Again, I'm not saying they're not important. I think it is extremely important as followers of Jesus Christ that you get baptized, because that's commanded by Jesus, am I right? But the mode of baptism, whether it is okay to baptize babies, for example, or must you baptize only believers? To me, all right, that is non-essential, all right? We can agree to disagree. I have my conviction. I reckon, you know, only when you believe 
can you be baptized? Because in the New Testament, it seems to me the order is clear. Believe first and be baptized. It's never the other way around. It's never baptized and then believe. But a lot of our brothers and sisters from the Presbyterian movement, for example, from the Anglican, from the Catholics, right? They baptize their infants. Does that mean they're not genuine believers necessarily? I think not, all right? They see baptism as a sign of covenant between the parents and, and God, for example. So for me, the issue over baptism is actually non-essential. You might think that's really stupid that people think it's so important. Let me tell you, read your church history. There are so many people called the Anabaptists who were murdered. I kid you not. They were killed by their fellow Christians for believing in believer's baptism. Check out your church history. To them, to these Christians who don't believe in believer's baptism, this is super important that you get this baptism right. All right? Again, I'm telling you, we got to be better than that. All right? Uh, at the issue of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Church, I divided over this issue. There's so many different churches who go their separate ways because they differ on how and when Jesus would come back again for the second time. For me, I don't really care. I have never been interested. In the area, people ask me all the time, why don't the rocks do a series on Revelation? Why don't we do a series? I said, okay, we can do one message maybe, <laughs> but we're not going to do a whole series. If you want to study it, by all means, there are people who are interested in that area. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm not saying it's wrong, all right? But for me, the most important thing about the second coming of Jesus Christ is that you know that He is coming back and you've got to be ready for it. doesn't matter when. Jesus says he's going to come like a thief in the night. You've got to be ready at all time. You've got to work while it is day, Jesus says, because nighttime is coming when no one can work anymore. So to me, the second coming of Christ, I believe it. But when, how, to me, it's not important. The church structure, you know, whether it's congregational, whether it's run by elders, whether it's run by pastors, to me, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we're all sinful human beings, no matter how perfect your structure is. Unless you submit to the leadership of Jesus Christ as the head of the church, you'll be in trouble anyway as a church. Uh, again, the issue of women in ministry. I thought we solved this, but recently it came up again, <laughs> especially in America. The issue over LGBTQ uh, stuff. I'm not, again, these are important issues that you need to have a conviction on, but I'm telling you, at the end of the day, do you really have to get it all right in all these different areas before you can be a follower of Jesus Christ? Personally, I think not, all right? What is essential then? That's what we're going to talk about in this series. Last week, Pastor Gordon brought a brilliant message. And the bottom line of that message is very simple. But to me, this is the most foundational of all, that Jesus Christ is God's son. you got to get that right. And again, if you're not a Christian here today, you want to explore what Christianity is all about. This is one of the questions, one of the major questions that you need to know for sure. If Jesus Christ is indeed God's son and wants to be your king and my king in this life. Okay? So that's the first time, the first one that we talk about in the first week. Today is the second week. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the Bible. Specifically, what must you believe about the Bible in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, this is my current Bible. I've been using this for the past at least 15 years, so it's a bit fray here and there, but I love this Bible. I have a few, by the way, at home, uh, more than a few. So if you need a Bible, you don't have uh, a Bible, come to me, and I'll, I'll probably give you one of my Bibles, all right? But uh, I love this Bible. This is one of my favorites. I, I come to this all the time to read. Uh, nowadays, I have my Bible on my phone as well, but from time to time, I still love reading the analog Bible. Since I became a Christian, I believe three things about this Bible, and many of the evangelical brothers and sisters of mine believe the same thing over these three issues of the Bible. The issue of inspiration, the issue of infallibility, and the issue of inerrancy, all right? And this is my personal belief. I believe the Bible is inspired, I believe it is infallible, and I believe the Bible is inerrant. What does that mean? That means the Bible is inspired by God, it's written by the human author, as I said before, but inspired by God, it's infallible in a matter of faith for us as followers of Jesus Christ, and it is without 
error or without mistakes. When I was preparing for full-time ministry, I went to Dallas Theological Seminary, who's very famous for being very strict on their view of this, on their view of the Bible. Uh, a lot of people from all over the world come to Dallas Theological Seminary to be trained on what it means to be a responsible Bible expositor, a Bible teacher. And we, they have so many great faculties. A lot of them have written so many different academic books. They've become famous. They became professors in, da, in different theological seminaries around the world. And one of the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary is this guy called Dr. Norm Geisler. Uh, up until recently, he actually died in July 2019. But he was the world authority when it comes to Bible inerrancy. His book is basically a textbook, and there's nothing else. If you go to Bible college, you're going to have to read his book on Bible inerrancy, all right? Uh, so, a case can be made. I'm just saying, for those of you who don't believe that this Bible is inerrant, you think the Bible contains error in it, I can prove to you, all right? Give me three weeks or four weeks. I will go through Dr. Norm Geisler's material with you. We go through uh, different passages of the Bible with you to prove to you that the Bible is indeed not only infallible, but inerrant. However, all right, listen carefully. Having said that, even though I believe the Bible is inerrant, this is also what I believe. I believe the validity of the Christian faith does not rely on a collection of error-free ancient texts. What I'm saying is this. It is okay, it is possible for you to continue to believe in Jesus Christ without believing necessarily that this manuscript is totally error-free. So the question is, what is the bottom line, all right? What must you believe about the Bible in order to follow Jesus? And this is extremely important for those of you who are exploring faith. You want to know, like, must I believe in the six-day creation? Must I believe in Jonah in the well? Must I believe in all this? What must I believe about this in order for me to be able to follow Jesus? I'm glad you asked. And I believe this is the answer, okay? You need to believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are actually reliable accounts of actual events surrounding Jesus Christ. This is extremely important. Why? Because if Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God, and what Jesus said about God is true, that means what Jesus said about you is true, that means what he quoted when he quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures that we call the Old Testament must also be true. So before you analyze, before you explore anything else about the Bible, why don't you go to the very basic, go to your public library, go find out from Google or whatever, is this Jesus a real deal? All right? I want to show you just very quickly how it is actually quite reasonable to believe. You don't even have to do much research that what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote here, they're extremely, extremely reliable historically. It's been proven and supported by different ancient manuscripts as well. I want to show you three. This is Pliny the Younger, written in AD 112 on the left. And then you have Tacitus, written in AD 64. And you have Josephus, AD 75. These are ancient historical documents that talk about the same events, the same people, the same history written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who, like what portion of our New Testament was written in AD 40 to 100. This is P52. You can find this today still. If you want to look at the manuscript for yourself, you can. Why do I say this? Why is this important? It proves that the New Testament is indeed reliable, right? A lot of people think that, oh man, there's a lot of uh, manipulation in this by the disciples of Jesus. How can it be manipulated, right? It was written at the time when a lot of the eyewitnesses were still around, right? And so, and you can also check, did Pliny say the same thing about who the Herod was during the time of Jesus? What about Tacitus? What about Josephus? Did they talk about Jesus? Actually, they did. 
You don't know that, right? A lot of skeptics who don't study the Bible, they just don't want to believe in Christianity. They say, oh, Jesus is just like the Easter rabbit. He's not a real deal. He's not a real historical person. Of course he's a real historical person. A lot of historians attest to his existence and what he did and everything else as well. So if you want to know if Christianity is reliable or not, check the historicity of Jesus. Because Christianity rises and falls on the identity of Jesus, which was validated by the resurrection of Jesus. This is why, this is why, if you watch a lot of YouTube, for example, right? Christian apologists, that those are the Christians who defend the faith of Christianity. They always build their case on the resurrection of Jesus, not on the inspiration of the Bible. For example, Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an atheist. He was an avid atheist. He was a lawyer. He was an investigative journalist with the Chicago Tribune. When he wanted to research on Christianity, he didn't research about the six-day creation. He didn't research about Jonah in the whale. He went straight to the most important thing that he could research on, the resurrection of Jesus. So this smart guy who was an atheist, a lawyer, investigative journalist, after he investigated about Jesus, he came to the conclusion that the resurrection was real. He gave his life to Jesus. He wrote so many different books about it. One of them is The Case for Christ, The, Sick, the Case for Resurrection. It was recently turned into a movie. So that's exactly what you should do. If you are an apologist, if you are researching Christianity, you must, you must go to the most important thing of them all, which is Jesus, his life, and his resurrection, right? In the New Testament, it was one of the most overlooked statements in the Bible, which I think is very, very important that you got to know. It was authored by Paul, the guy who used to hate the Christians, and he wrote half of the New Testament, and he wrote this, and I need you to pay attention to what he wrote, okay? He said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, if Christ had not, has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Our preaching, my preaching, Paul said, is useless. I'm, what I'm doing is useless. I'm, my getting persecuted, imprisoned, beaten, abused by people for my preaching, for my faith, is useless if Christ has not been raised from the dead. And he didn't stop there. He doubled down. Not only is my preaching useless, so is your faith. Your faith is useless. The only reason, Paul says, why I'm taking Jesus seriously is because of the resurrection of Jesus that is affirmed. I met him on the way to persecute more Christians. I saw him with my own two eyes. See, the problem with Jesus was not what he taught, all right? What he taught was brilliant, but what was problematic with what Jesus did was what he said about himself. You see, he claimed to be God, and the resurrection of Jesus validated his claims to be God. The resurrection is his evidence that he has authority over life, over death, over your life and my life, and that's why he can be our king. And Paul is still not done. He said this, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And then you say, but I believe in Jesus. And Paul says, it doesn't matter what you believe. None of it matters if Jesus had not been raised from the dead. There's so many good teachers out there in the world with good teachings. Buddha teaches great stuff, right? Um, Lao Tzu, he teaches great stuff. But none of them raised from the dead. That's the difference. That's the offense <laughs> that caused Jesus to be crucified in the first place. Do you know that? So that is the foundation of our faith. Here's Paul's, Paul's point, and this is what you must get right, all right? The foundation of our Christian faith is an event, which is the resurrection. And that event, the resurrection, launched a movement. We call it Christianity, all right? And it is the Christians who assembled this together. Do you know that the most devout followers of Jesus never owned this, never read this? There was no Bible to read until the 4th century. I don't know if you know that. 
And yet these men and women turn the world upside down. That's why you're here today. That's why I'm standing here today worshiping Jesus, even though they never had this. So my question is, why are you so quickly abandoning your faith for a book that doesn't exist for 300 years? Why do you so quickly abandon your faith over the issue of a guy eaten by fish? Why do you abandon your faith over issues that they're maybe important, but they're really, really non-essentials when you think about it, right? Now, maybe some of you are thinking, uh, but the reason why we believe in Jesus and the res- resurrection in the first place is because it's in the Bible, Right? That's why this is important for us. Well, it's in the Bible now for you. That's right. But in the first three centuries, these are not yet assembled together. They were still being written. Right? So that means, how can this be the foundation of our faith when it didn't exist for 300 years? Actually, when it comes to the English language, this is not widespreadly owned by everybody until the year 1500 when the printing press was discovered, right? So for 1,500 years, the English-speaking world (laughs) don't have this. How can this be the foundation of our faith? Or how about this? Think about it this way. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, will we even have this? Will you care about the Old Testament if Jesus died and did not rise again? No. You just said, oh, that's some holy scripture for some community, the Jewish people. I don't really care about that. The reason why you and I even care about the Old Testament is because we want to know the history of our faith because Jesus rose again from the dead, right? We want to know how, how, how did it come about that God loved us so much that He prepared the way from the calling of Abraham, from the calling of David to the sending of Jesus so that we can have this amazing relationship with the Creator God. We wanted to know, but none of that mattered if Jesus hadn't been risen from the dead. So what's the foundation of our faith? It is the event, an important event called the resurrection, all right? How did Christianity grow so fast? Not because of this, because of an event. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, Peter, all right, was on fire. (laughs) Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the people, Rulers and elders of the people, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. He did not care if he's going to get into trouble for saying this or not. You killed him, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. The event, this, this speech came after he healed a blind man begging at the gate called Beautiful, right? He was like on fire. He wasn't scared at all. Remember, this was the same Peter who denied Jesus, how many times? Three times, right? It was not the teaching of Jesus that made him bold. When he knew all the teachings of Jesus, he was with Jesus for three and a half years. What made the change from a cowardice, scared, fearful Peter to this bold, amazingly eloquent, like courageous Peter? Peter said so himself. It is the resurrection that changed me. Before that, I was a coward, but <laughs> hey, The resurrection, I was there with Jesus. I did not believe him when he said he was going to, you know, be back to life again after three days. But then he did it, and my life has never been the same since. And so what happened was when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that this man had been with Jesus. They realized, man, this... These guys, they were fishermen. They were not educated, right? The Greek word actually is idiotai. I did a research, idiotai. You know what English would we get from idiotai? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not an idiotai. Okay. <laughs> These guys, like, they were not knowledge, knowledgeable about anything, about theology, about anything at all, but they were so courageous, right? And then this is what happened. They called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. 
Again, very bold, very courageous. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what? About the Bible? We cannot help speaking about the Old Testament, about the six-day creation, the Jonah and the whale, the Noah and the animals. We could not help speaking about that because that's so important. No, we could not help speaking about what we have seen and heard, which was the resurrection of Jesus. One chapter later, they were about to be killed for saying this, right? The apostles were brought in, made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of ancestors, again, he just could not help speaking about it. I mean, we just look at a few verses. How many times did Peter say, raise Jesus from the dead? Jesus was raised from the dead. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed. Again, he just accused like, you did this. But God could not be defeated. He rose again from the dead. Let me ask you again, why are you here? Why am I here? How did Christianity survive the first, second, third century without this? How did Peter and the apostles, the first Christians, the first followers of Jesus Christ, how did they become so courageous, so bold, so fearless? Because God raised a man from the dead. That's who they follow. That's who they were willing to give up their own lives for, right? If there was any conflict at all in the, fe- in the first century, the conflict was not over the issue of inspiration or inerrancy. The issue was over the issue of application. The question that were brought before the first apostles was this. Must the Gentiles believe in the Hebrew Bible in order to follow Jesus? That's the question. Must they be circumcised? Must they follow the law of Moses? For all these Gentiles. So Gentiles in, the Gentiles in Antioch, they were willing to submit their lives to King Jesus. They knew virtually nothing about the Jewish law, the Old Testament stories. They had never read it. All right? Are they required to read it? Were they required to follow all the laws of the, of the Old Testament? James, the half-brother of Jesus, made the following statement in conclusion. In my judgment, therefore... We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, no, they don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to read this law of Moses. They don't need to know anything about our heritage. We need to make it easy for them. Eventually, in order to enrich their faith, of course, the books are available for them to know the history of their faith. Just like if you want to know about your grandparents, right? It's always good to know where you come from. But for your own life right now, you, re- you really don't need to know where or when your great, 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 great grandparents live. Am I right? But if you had known, your life would be more enriched. You'd be better, I suppose. You know what I mean? So, if the, po- the apostles believe that they should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God, we shouldn't make it difficult either. The Bible, let me tell you, I'm, I'm coming to the end. The Bible should not be an obstacle to our faith, all right? Is the Bible important? Yes. Is it essential? Yes. But the Bible is not our starting place. Jesus is our starting place. He is the starting and the ending point of our faith. You know, a lot of Christians elevate this Bible to the point of idolatry. I kid you not. They make this as an excuse for their bad behavior because they want to be biblical. I'm telling you, right? There's a word for it. The word is bibliolatry. That means you idolize the Bible. That is not right. You cannot elevate this in the, to the same position as Jesus. So the Bible should never be the obstacle to our faith. It is extremely important, but it is not the starting point of faith Jesus is. So what is the Bible? What do we believe about it? I believe the Bible is a document, uh, or the Bible documents God's redemptive activity in the world, culminating in the arrival, in the, uh, in the fulfillment of all His plan for the world, the arrival of His Son, Jesus Christ, our final King, over whom every creation will be subject to, and over whom 
uh, Jesus will get all the glory, right? And He will come back again to get all of us and bring us to glory. That's the whole point of the Bible, to tell you the amazing love that your heavenly Father has from the very beginning. As early as the Garden of Eden, God says, Adam, where are you? He wants to seek you. He wants to seek me, all right? Because he loves you, because he loves me. That's why this is so important. That's why I read this every single day. If you're a skeptic, here's my challenge to you. Read it as a history book. Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You got to prove for yourself that Jesus is indeed not only historical, he is God's son, he's your king, and he wants to have a relationship with you. That's where you begin. That's where you begin. The rest is just detail. But as a teenager, I was 18 years old, it's the details that changed my life. It's the details. It caused me to change my whole life around. From a teenager who didn't really care about anything, didn't care about his family, didn't care about study, didn't care about other people, on my way to ruin my life. But when I read this, and I met Jesus through this, He just changed my life completely. And it's still changing my life today. And it has the same potential for you, and for me, if you lean back in its details, it'll change yours as well. Because John, who was there for all of it, he was there. He was a Jewish boy. He knew this, the, uh, this, the, uh, the story arc. John would say this to you. For God so loved the world. The whole world, not just the good people, everybody that He gave. That's what God does. He gave His most precious of all, His one and only Son, so that whoever, whoever means whoever, no one is excluded, whoever believes in Him will not die, but have everlasting life that's the truth you can hang your faith on right that's the truth you should be willing to die for the other stuff they're great they're fantastic but at the end of the day our faith starts and ends with Jesus he's the author and he's the finisher of our faith let's stand up We're going to pray right now, and I just want to pray for you, for those of you who are... For you, this is a real issue. It's not just academics, right? You're this close, probably, of leaving faith because of some of the questions that you can't answer. For some of you, this, is, this hits close to home because it already happened in your household. Your kids already leave, ch leave church. Your husbands, your wives, people that you love, and so we're going to pray to God together. We're going to ask God for the impossible because only God can change hearts. Yeah? The theory is all nice and good, but at the end of the day, it's the Spirit of God that draws people to Himself. So we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for you. And we're going to pray that our faith will continue to rise to the, to the next level and the next level so we, we can be more and more like Jesus. Because the, the faith that is powerful is the faith that is put into action. It's what you do with what you believe that will really make a difference. Not only in your life, but in the lives of the people around you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we heard today. Holy Spirit, continue to process this in our hearts. Whatever we are struggling with. God, you know the deepest most protected part of our hearts. Nothing is a secret to you. So Father, I pray 
that you meet us where we are. You meet the people who are struggling over these issues where they are. Because we know, Lord, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing in this world that you would rather do than drawing people to yourself, having a relationship with them that will last all the way into eternity. And so, Father, to that end, we pray that we will learn to love your word, that we will learn to start reading your word on a consistent basis because your word has power. Your word is sharper than a double-edged sword penetrating to the deepest, most secret part of our hearts, Lord, revealing what only you can reveal. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word. It is so precious. Help us to cherish it. Help us to value it. Help us to honor it. Help us to become more like Jesus because of it. And dismiss us with your blessings, we pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. May God bless you through and through so that the people around you will be blessed and God's name will be glorified now and forevermore. Everyone who's blessed, sit together with me. Amen, amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday. If you need prayer, please come forward. Our prayer leaders would love to pray for you. God bless.